In some places in Sydney, it's still possible to see key signs of the city's early development. Flagstaff Hill, now called Observatory Hill, is one of these special places, the highest point in town, a place where you could see to the heads of the ocean and up the rivers into the interior. The observatory was established in 1788 by Philip and staffed by Lieutenant William Dawes, who was tasked with accurately establishing the longitude of Sydney, keeping a weather log and observing a comet that was expected in August. Dawes befriended a number of Aborigines, including young Paddy Garang, and his notebooks have provided us with the most extensive vocabulary of the local language. It was always a place for receiving and sending signals, first from the flag staff, later by telegraph wire, it was a lookout place to guard against insurrection from the inland and invasion from the sea. A windmill built there in 1797 harnessed the winds to grind the colony's wheat. Then, in 1804, an octagonal stone fort was built around the mill to defend the town against the possibility of Irish rebels storming down the road from Parramatta. In the 1850s, a handsome stone observatory, complete with government astronomer, rose above the old fort to scan the skies. Local working people once used Flagstaff Hill as a common, but trustees were appointed in the 1870s to gentrify and control. They banned goats, washing, roaming children, indolent and immoral people, and cricket matches. They erected iron half fences around the rim of what remained of the hill and planted lawns and fig trees. The figs are spreading giants now, and the lawns roll down to abrupt drops where the hill was carved away by 19th century quarrying and 20th century road construction. There remains that sense of quietness that high ground has. The city's huge towers of glass, concrete and steel are close by, but somehow distant too. The observatory is now a museum, open on special nights for stargazing. But 200 years ago, Flagstaff Hill was already bald, stripped of its angophora and peppermint, all gone for hearth fires and bread ovens and building. Aboriginal people vanished too, as they were forced to retreat to the edge of town and its fringing bushland. They became doubly invisible as they dropped out of mainstream historical consciousness too, because modern accounts of the colony turned on the wealth and progress model, in which Aboriginal people, along with convicts, were relegated to a sort of prehistory, a past that Sydney was rapidly leaving behind. But Aboriginal people have always been here, and as I watch this man put his heart and soul into an Aboriginal tour of the rocks, my own heart skips a beat, and I'm not sure whether it's for joy at their survival, or guilt at not having done more to secure it. Now another good use for this bottle, the Sydney Golden Bottle, is in the fresh water, if you're doing that and all the fish come around, you can get large amount of these leaves, put them in the water, takes away the oxygen, they become stunned mullets. Is it like a saying, we have stunned mullet, but they just float to the top. You have about 90 seconds before they come back to life, because you not kill them, they've just got lack of oxygen. So you, then you can just pick up what you need, and then the rest come back to life and swim away. Now, earlier, I asked young auntie here, I'm going to get some leaves just to show the nice people today. One of the uses, she's really good to us. So I grabbed some of these leaves a bit earlier from up there because it's a bit slippery and wet. Now I've just got some of these leaves off the Sydney Golden Bottle and I'm going to crush them up. All right, there we go. And then I'm just going to cut my hand and put a little bit of water in there. Extra water. And then I'm just going to rub it. And tell me what you can see coming out there. Wow. What can you see coming out there? There you go, look at that, see? Anyone want to grab that? Do you want to feel that? This is Lamandra, known as Lamandra. Again, young ladies, this is one of the main plants that they would use for weaving. The men would always make string and rope as well. So I'm just going to get one, just to show you today from this young lady here. She's really nice for us as well. You have to be careful when you're pulling it out, because it gives you really bad paper cuts. Yeah. So the Lamandra is like a corner store, isn't it? Yeah, so where do you get all your food from? Oh, just a shop. Yeah, you go to the shop. <laughs> or the supermarket. Where's where's the Aboriginal um, shops? Uh, Everywhere. <laughs> That's all about supermarket, eh? Now, as you can see, this here, it's pretty tough. This is the tougher one. I'll pass that around so you can have a look. It's a lot stronger than that Dianella. So this is the main one that they would use for weaving. 
So what I'm going to do is just strip it down a little bit for you. And I'll just show you. Have you seen uh, friendship bracelets? Yeah. Yeah, because I'm not a weaver. The women would do it. But I'm just showing you just as an example. I just strip that into four. And then if I just did a little pattern like this, you can see it. One more and I'll just show you. Here you go. See, I'm just making a pattern there. Yeah. Yep. If Morgan cut himself and it's a bit deep, clean it with fresh water first, don't you? Yeah. Then you're going to need something to close that gap up. Yeah. So do you know there's different spider webs? One of them is the golden orb. You see a spider web? Oh, yes. And it's got those long cables. Yeah. Well, those long cables are very sticky and really strong because they hold that spider web in the wind, don't they? And it's also got some antiseptic qualities. And so, I might get that cable then, after I've cleaned it up, wrap that around your arm, yeah. close it up, and then I'll need a band-aid, don't I? So we have this paper bark. You ever seen paper bark? You know paper bark off the tree. You see that powdery stuff that comes off? That's got antiseptic qualities as well. So I'm going to use this. After I've, you know, cleaned it, yeah. put the spider web on, I'm going to put that bandage on. This is a really rough one. I need something to tie it up. One thing I could use is the lamandra. There you go. This is just a rough one. Aborigines call Benelong Point Tybergul, the place where the waters meet. Tybergul was where Governor Philip built the first private brick house in Sydney and the first to use roof tiles. Both bricks and tiles were made at the brick fields by convicts working under James Bloodworth. The house was, of course, built for Benelong. There was no door, no glazing and no window shutter. There was a fireplace, but Benelong lit his fires outside in front of the doorway, just as he would in a gunya. It took us nearly 200 years of inexperience building Aboriginal housing to get that right. As for the Opera House, it's generally said that the first performance there was by Paul Robeson on the construction site in 1960. In fact, the first performance was to a vice regal audience by Benelong, Colby and 22 others in March 1791. You and me, we sweat and strain body all aching and racked with pain tote that budge lift that bail show a little grit and you land fascinating that our famous pain. opera house has its theatrical roots with an aboriginal corroboree and an african-american just behind the opera house we find the tarpian way steps hewn into the sandstone cliff they lead to a gate bordering the domain the public land that governor philip with great foresight set aside from development Imagine the extraordinary changes witnessed from this vantage point. From the smoke of a thousand campfires and women out fishing in their nawi, to a cove engulfed by concrete steel and glass, with Benelong's rude brick house on Tybergul replaced by the Sydney Opera House, and the world's most beautiful harbour, now spanned by the largest and best known steel arch bridge in the world. Two trees that probably germinated in the early 1700s have somehow managed to survive this transformation. They are the last of their kind so close to the city, a literal stone's throw from the nation's longest settled, most crowded and heavily used precinct. As direct living links to the full span of Australia's birth and growth, they are unique and irreplaceable. Europeans found Australia's unusual plants as surprising as its bizarre animals. While some missed the bright green flush of the northern spring and the vibrant displays of autumn colour, what contents like the look of the place. The general face of the country is certainly pleasing, being diversified with gentle ascents and winding little valleys, covered for the most part with large spreading trees, which afford a succession of leaves in all seasons. In those places where trees are scarce, a variety of flowering shrubs abound, most of them entirely new to a European, and surpassing in beauty, fragrance and number all I ever saw in an uncultivated state. Among these, a tall shrub bearing an elegant white flower which smells like English May is particularly delightful. They named this shrub the tea tree. But trees stood in the way of settler ambitions. Just a few months into 1788, Surgeon Morgan wrote home to his brother describing how for the past few months the principal business has been the clearing of land 
cutting, grubbing and burning down trees, soaring up timber and plank for building. Environmental problems soon became apparent. In 1803, Governor King issued a general order against the removal of trees from riverbanks in an effort to prevent erosion. By 1812, the domain was being described as little better than a rocky waste full of large stumps. The city area was largely denuded of native plants by the 1830s, save for the domain. But even here there was no understory left by 1860, so that only the old trees remained. I know what this is. It's the fall of religion. Oh, no, no, it's the, it's the shield that somewhere in that is there. Oh, in this? I thought, yeah. it, I thought it was in there. Perhaps that's the pattern. So the Aboriginal shield that's pattern that's must be this one double here. Cross. Double cross. Huh? No? I don't think so. You don't think that's a falling apart bit? I think As Louisa Meredith complained in 1839, in England, we plant groves and woods and think our country residence is unfinished and incomplete without them. But here, the exact contrary is the case, and unless a settler can see an expanse of bare, naked, unvaried, shadeless, dry and dusty land spread all around him, he fancies his dwelling wild and uncivilised. Yes, yeah, listen there. Hey, hey. Cheers. Come on. Come on. Take a walk. Right, ready, mate? Let's go. Predictions and explanations for the disappearance of Sydney's Aboriginal people began in the late 1790s. In 1803, Sydney Gazette claimed the warriors would all be killed in the course of their great contests. Others said it was due to the loss of forests and hunting grounds. A rare few recognised the fundamental injustice of Aboriginal dispossession but they were drowned out by a cacophony of explanations which, for the main part, excused Europeans and blamed the Aborigines themselves for their own demise. The yardstick colonists used to gauge Aboriginal progress, or lack of it, was the same that Philip had hoped would seduce and civilise them. Initially trinkets, then clothing, food and housing. Europeans expected them to be grateful for these gifts. They never were. Most distressing was that Aborigines refused to wear clothes. While some wore hats and jackets, they especially hate clothes for the lower part of the body, which was unfortunate for the Europeans, since that was the part that bothered them. Even after dress rules were introduced in the late 1820s, clothes were shucked off as soon as possible. European-style housing held little appeal either. Though some lodged in the houses of gentlemen, probably in kitchens and outhouses, they returned each night to campsites in the bushlands surrounding the town. Curious nighttime voyeurs found families asleep, cuddled together around fires, or sheltered in bark and bow gunyas, exactly as they had done before the invasion. Governor Macquarie had this wall built to enclose the government domain, or part of the government domain, because that was his private garden, really. Uh, it wasn't until after Macquarie that this was opened up to the public, in fact, uh, Macquarie had one stage had three free settlers flogged for having for climbing over this wall and entering the domain. Aboriginal Sydney was perhaps best known for the great public contests and fights which continued from the 1790s throughout the 1800s and into the 1820s. They were often held at the Brickfields grounds, probably at today's Hyde Park where the War Memorial stands. These contests became part of the annual round of events and were constantly well attended by all descriptions of people notwithstanding the risk of being wounded by a random spear. Governor Lachlan Macquarie and his wife Elizabeth were genuinely interested in civilising the natives and like Philip, they welcomed the Aboriginal chiefs into Government House. But the long-held tradition of non-intervention in their affairs was becoming increasingly irksome. How could Sydney emerge as the elegant, progressive and virtuous city they envisaged if visitors were confronted with naked savages fighting in the streets. Eventually Macquarie banned the contests altogether.
By the late 1820s, most Europeans saw only two kinds of Aborigines, if they saw them at all. In the towns and settled areas, they were degraded paupers, great fodder for popular caricatures and fast dying out. Then there were those still living in a pure state of nature in the bush, also to be pitied for their savage state, but at least uncorrupted by European ways. By the 1830s, the real Aborigine had been invented, but you had to go up country to see them. And the further you moved from civilization, the more genuine they became, until you reached those who were, presumably, perfectly original. It's an audio sculptures with a large audio component, so you hear the sounds of maritime Sydney, you hear the voices of Wharfies talking about their work and the era that they brought to work. The Macquarie settled Bungaree and his people at George's Head on the north side of the harbour in 1815. Most observers were cynical about this experiment in Aboriginal small farming, and some wrote it off immediately. Bungaree's clan did make a start clearing and planting there, but soon went back to their customary fishing and to their camp closer to Sydney. The Macquarie's remained undeterred, however, for Elizabeth attempted to establish another black town on another romantic harbour foreshore this time at Carrigan, or Elizabeth Bay. Again, huts were built in neat rows and convict overseers sent to help. A road was built down the slope from South Head Road and the place became something of a tourist attraction with ladies and gentlemen driving down in carriages to see the black farmers and their picturesque little cottages. The Aborigines liked this place very much. It was reportedly very much frequented and delighted in by the Sydney blacks. Their traditional great camping grounds at Woolamaloo Bay and Rushcutters Bay were close by too. They were soon dispossessed of this promised land a second time. Newly arrived colonists brought a new aspiration to Sydney, the desire for fashionable suburban living. They wanted elegance detached villas in idyllic gardens with water views, separate from the city, but close to it too. Within a few years, Elizabeth Bay was hot property. Governor Darling gave it away in a 54-acre lot to his new colonial secretary, Alexander Maclay, who proceeded to remodel it as elegant gardens for a classical dream house he could not afford. The claims of the Sydney Aborigines were ignored, though Maclay took some interest in their welfare. Soon, the ridge between those two key Eora places, Woolamaloo and Curridgen at Elizabeth Bay, was studded with more ostentatious mansions, and Australia's first suburb was born. Okay, welcome everyone to Elizabeth Bay House. For many, many years, the grandest home in the colony. Now, this room that we're standing in is, is the library. And when the house was completed, this was also the largest room in the colony until the new government house was finished in 1845. So this home was built between 1835 and 1839 and built for a man called Alexander Maclay a very proud Scotsman and a man who came over to Australia in around 1826 to become our colonial secretary. And at the time, colonial secretary was second in charge, so an incredibly important position. And he took up that position underneath Governor Ralph Darling. And the other thing about Alexander Maclay, he had an absolute passion for collecting moths and butterflies. Lepidoptera, it's called. So, he is not the type of man to go out with a net and catch his own butterflies. This is the era of 
gentlemen collectors and they were in fact purchasing pre-court specimens, pre-pinned specimens and for a while he had the largest individual collection of moths and butterflies of anyone in the world. He packs up his six unmarried daughters, he packs up his scientific collection, they sail to Australia and he becomes very good friends with Ralph Darling when he arrives here. And he became so fond of Alexander that he in fact gifted him this land in, Ale in Elizabeth Bay to, to use as he wished. And the thing about that was that this land had actually been put aside for public use by Macquarie. He moves into the house in 1839 with his uh, six unmarried daughters, his wife, and his eldest son comes over here to live with him as well. William Sharp had actually been loaning money to his father for many, many years. And it got to a point in 1845, because William Sharp said, I, I cannot loan you any more money. He also takes control of his father's insect collection. William Sharp is quite a scientific mind as well, but he's kind of the next generation of scientists, sort of more around the period of Charles Darwin. He's the one that's using these insect collections to come up with new theories of evolution. He also used his father's scientific collection to write a lot of um, scientific papers that were published in journals. So we have this kind of first generation which is all about discovering these beautiful things, trying to unravel the natural world. We have this next generation who are really starting to figure out how things interact, are using those specimens to, to publish papers. So he's also important in the history of that Maclay collection and he does expand the collection as well quite a lot. He doesn't have children however and so when he dies in 1865 the house is then passed on to the next generation, his cousin, which is this gentleman over here, he's another William unfortunately, makes it a bit confusing, he is William John Maclay. Again, another generation of scientific mind. He takes over the collection he really expands the collection because he is of this third very kind of intrepid explorer um, stage of, of scientific discovery. This is kind of the 1860s, the 1870s. He actually buys a, a ship, sails it up the north coast of Queensland and all the way to Papua New Guinea and collects specimens, collects original objects and artefacts. This leads to the 1970s when we start to become aware of the importance of this house again and it was decided that the Cumberland Council would do up the property and gift it to the Lord Mayor of Sydney to be his personal residence. And again the people of Sydney felt that this really wasn't very fair. This time they, they kind of won that battle and the Historic Houses Trust was essentially for, uh, formed to look after this property and also another property called Walkler's House in around 1980. And since that time, we have been recreating the Maclay period of occupation. So these beautiful cabinets all around the room are still filled with Maclay's collection. This is a, a prop one that we had made up a few years ago. These are all obviously real insects, but this is essentially what most of the drawers look like. Some are completely packed with insects, but a lot of them do still have these original beautiful pins, some of them dating back to the 1780s. Um, during the 1830s and 1840s there was a beautiful artist in Sydney called Conrad Martins who did a whole series of lovely watercolour portraits essentially of people's homes on the harbour. This is sort of how the house should have looked because as you can see there is a veranda.